Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast for the 3rd of September 2012. The podcast where cheaters may prosper, but we try and make them perspire. This is your host, Shane Killian. Let's create an offensive sign for the news of the bogus. If you've been deaf from birth, like three-year-old Hunter Spanger, then you don't identify your name with sounds, but with signs made with your hands. And you identify just as closely with that as a hearing person does with the sound of his own name. But Grand Island Public Schools has tried to stop young Hunter from signing his name because, get this, they say the sign violates their weapons policy. Hunter's parents taught him sign language using the Signing Exact English Method, or SEE, which is a formalized version of American Sign Language. The sign for the word Hunter is made by forming the fingers like a gun and waving them as if firing. To make it his proper name, Hunter crosses his index and middle fingers. But the school says this sign violates the weapons policy, which says, quote, Students are forbidden to knowingly and voluntarily possess, handle, transmit, or use any instrument in school, on school grounds, or at school functions that is a firearm, weapon, or looks like a weapon. Yeah, except this isn't a weapon, it's his hands! Are you saying he can't bring his hands to school? And the sign doesn't resemble a weapon, it resembles his name! And his name, in sign language, is very much his own, just as anyone else's spoken name is to them. The policy also says, quote, This policy shall cover any object or item which could be used to injure another person or whose clear intent is to resemble an item which could cause injury and which has no school-related reason for being in a school or on school grounds. Such items will be considered weapons for the purposed of this policy. Students who are in possession of the aforementioned articles will be subject to mandatory suspension or expulsion procedures. You know, before they go on about sign language, maybe they should learn some basic grammar first, especially if they're going to be teaching kids. But of course, this does have a school-related reason. It's his name! He needs to be able to use his name, doesn't he? A spokes stooge for the school said they were just trying to come up with the best possible solution for the child. What, does he think the best possible solution involves not allowing him to sign his own name? How sad is it that the institutes that are supposed to be educating our young suffer from such rampant stupidity? And there seems to be no room for common sense here. They're so stupid that they would have been this week's idiot extraordinaire if another group's extraordinary fail hadn't soared past them. A group that is, sadly, in charge of half the country. More's the pity. This podcast has covered police shooting the family dog before, and it's very sad, because to such families, a dog is very much a member of the family, just like a child would be, and the shooting just as tragic. But what happens when, instead of shooting a dog, they shoot an actual person? That's what happened to Jennifer Ore, former Air and Sea rescuer with the U.S. Navy, when San Diego County Sheriff's Deputy Luke Bearhalter was in her backyard looking for a suspicious male. When she asked him why he shot her, he said, I'm sorry. You startled me. She heard the shot, saw the that's right. the smoke and the fire, and that's when she turned and she said, I, I prayed, oh God, you know, don't let this hit any major thing. According to the victim's brother, who shared these pictures from the hospital, the deputies entered the backyard without warning, didn't respond to her calls of identification, and shot her at point-blank range. He fired without, like, warning or say, freeze or anything. And then uh, just as she saw, like the black smoke coming out the barrel and the fire. She turned her body like this. What's worse is, the Sheriff's Department report said that Ore was, quote, shot in the arm, when in actuality the bullet went through one of her breasts, out her bicep, and into her pinky. And the bullet went through her left breast, through the bottom, going right right through her nipple, into her bicep, and then out her pinky. I feel they are just trying to cover up their mistakes. And, uh, and they know the truth, they just don't want to admit it. And he tells us Orly says she was treated horribly and had to administer her own first aid. After she got shot, she stood there for a minute and went to put her hand on the officer that shot her to like gain her balance and he was like, oh, get your hand off of me. 
And she's like, but you just shot me in the chest. For now, Orly remains in the hospital recuperating. For the family, they want deputies to acknowledge what they say is the truth. And all we want is for them to own up to their mistake and be responsible, just like anybody else. How did it even come to the point where deputies searching for a suspicious male were on the private property of a female in her backyard with their guns drawn? Well, don't worry, the sheriff's office is on the case. They've launched an investigation and placed Bear Halter on administrative leave. That basically means he gets a paid vacation. Isn't it such a relief to know the police are here to protect and serve? The controversial National Defense Authorization Act gives the federal government the power to indefinitely detain American citizens without charge. Some are claiming it's not true, just a conspiracy theory or whatever, but recent court proceedings have not only shown it to be the case, they have shown the complete refusal of the Obama administration to assure the judge they're not already doing it. Lawyers for the Obama administration came right out in open court and confirmed that yes, the NDAA gives the government this power. They stated, on the record, that it could even be used against war correspondents, one of the big fears when the NDAA was passed. Not only that, but the Obama administration refused to give clear definitions of several vague but critical terms, apparently reserving the right to make them mean whatever they want to at the time. The judge, Catherine Forrest, issued an injunction against it, but the Obama administration not only appealed, but asserted the power of the executive to actually disobey the judge's order. As this podcast has shown before, the Obama administration has made it clear that the courts are no impediment to what they want to do. The court wanted assurance from Obama's lawyers that the NDAA hasn't been used to detain citizens without trial, but the lawyers refused to give such an assurance, even after Judge Forrest's injunction. In effect, they refused to state that Obama had complied with a direct and binding court order. You know, it's issues like this that put the current political wrangling into perspective. With all the big deal being made about abortion, which the president has no power over anyway, or gay marriage, which the president pays lip service to but refuses to do anything about, you really have to wonder why the president having the power to detain any of us at a mere whim and absolutely refusing to listen to the courts about it doesn't even make the radar, let alone become one of the defining issues of this election. This podcast has covered cases where Obama's so-called stimulus spending has resulted in meager creation of jobs and ridiculous when compared to the amount of money spent per job. Now, the Washington Times has reported that about half a million dollars of this stimulus money went to advertising on MSNBC that created precisely zero jobs. The U.S. Department of Labor spent the money on ads promoting Obama's green training jobs, aired on Rachel Maddow and Keith Olbermann's shows. Spending reports show the amount to be $450,000. As for the number of jobs created as a result, the official project report states that the number is precisely zero. Obama touted his stimulus as providing for the infrastructure and other shovel-ready jobs. But other than jobs for select people at a PR firm, what has this money really done for us? It seems that much more of it has gone to promote Obama's political agenda than the 3.5 million jobs he promised to create with his $829 billion stimulus package. But in February of 2009, when the stimulus bill was passed, the unemployment rate was 8.3%, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. In July 2012, the most recent figure as of this recording, the unemployment rate was 8.3%. Gee, thanks, Obama! Of course, what they'll come back with is that at least he stopped it from getting worse. Yeah, and think how much worse the patient would be if we didn't use leeches. The fact is, when governments don't try to spend us out of recessions, like in 1921 or 1946, or like Estonia and other countries that are genuinely cutting taxes and spending and getting their debt under control, the recession is ended in a year or two. Seems to me we need more fiscal responsibility and less taxpayer-funded political advertising. When it comes to knowing if medicines are effective, you can rely on their approval by the FDA. Or you could wave a magic wand and hope for the best. 
At least in some cases, they amount to the same thing, according to Dr. Stephen Novella in an entry he wrote on the blog of the James Randi Educational Foundation, for whom he is a senior fellow and director of their science-based medicine project. According to Dr. Novella, that approved medication just might be nothing but plain water. The problem, as many of you have already guessed, deals with homeopathy, which, for the uninitiated, is basically the art of taking absolutely nothing for an illness and pretending that will cure it. The problem goes back to day one, with the passage of the 1938 Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which established the FDA, the principal author of which just so happened to be a practitioner of homeopathy. Well, gee. Today, homeopathic drugs... No, wait, they're not drugs. Homeopathic remedies... No, wait, they're not remedies. They don't cure a blasted thing. Homeopathic treatments... No, homeopathic medicine... No, geez, what can you call these things? Oh, I got it. Homeopathic nothings. Today, homeopathic nothings receive automatic approval from the FDA. No need to go through all that testing that real drugs have to go through, you know, to show that they actually work and stuff. But it gets even more bizarre. Creating homeopathic nothings involves taking pure water and going through a very elaborate process of dissolving absolutely nothing into it. The solutions are diluted way past the point where there's no chance of even a single molecule of the active ingredient remaining. But get this finding from an FDA report of their investigation of homeopathic nothings manufactured by A. Nelson and Company Limited. Quote, The investigator also observed, for batch number 36659, that one out of every six bottles did not receive the dose of active homeopathic drug solution due to the wobbling and vibration of the bottle assembly during filling of the active ingredient. The active ingredient was instead seen dripping down the outside of the vial assembly. Your firm lacked controls to ensure that the active ingredient is delivered to every bottle. Yeah, you actually have to put your nonsense ingredient into a vial before you dilute away every single molecule of it. Don't you know anything? Another part of the inspection report read, quote, Your firm lacks control of the variation for the amount of the active ingredient. Actually, it sounds like they've got the perfect control to me, dilute it way past Avogadro's limit. That way, you've controlled for precisely the amount of active ingredient remaining. None at all. One very interesting part of it is this finding, quote, During the inspection, the investigator observed glass fragments present during the manufacture, Specifically, glass fragments that were observed in the click pack assembly enclosed area where open glass files are inserted into the outer plastic click pack sheets and move uncovered on the conveyance mechanism. Your firm failed to implement adequate measures to prevent glass contamination and had no documentation to demonstrate that appropriate line clearance and cleaning is conducted following occurrences of glass breakage, which has been a recurring problem. Of course, they don't say at what point along the line this contamination occurred. As long as it happens before the 18C stage of a 30C solution, who cares? No molecules of glass or any other contaminant would remain in the final product. Of course, no medicine either, but hey, at least we aren't getting glass contaminants in our sugar pills. Nice job, FDA. The last part of the report is probably the most bizarre. It can be summed up in the following quote. Homeopathic products offered for conditions not amenable to over-the-counter use must be marketed as prescription products. Yeah, you need to go and get a doctor's prescription to get that plain water and those sugar pills. Now don't you feel so much better knowing we have the FDA stopping the manufacture of bogus fake remedies and only allowing real fake remedies to come to market? As the old saying goes, be careful what you wish for, you might get it. That was the case when the state of Louisiana passed a bill allowing religious schools into the state charter school system. The idea was that this would allow more children to get a Christian education. Imagine their surprise when Islamic schools began applying for charters as well. Hey, when we said religious freedom, we didn't mean for other religions. The bill was the Minimum Foundations Program, passed back in June. The idea was that students who didn't do well at government schools could get vouchers to attend charter schools designated by the state. A laudable goal, except they opened the door wide for religious schools. And almost immediately, the Islamic School of Greater New Orleans applied for the program. The school requested 38 student vouchers and was met with almost immediate opposition. 
Republican State Representative Kenneth Havard said that he would oppose any attempt to fund Islamic teaching. Democratic State Representative Sam Jones said, quote, It'll be the Church of Scientology next year. Yeah, well, what did you expect? Did you really think that only Christian schools would apply and schools run by other religions would just sit there and not try to take advantage of government funds and higher enrollment? The Islamic school backed down in the face of the opposition, but that's not going to be the end of the Louisiana government's woes. Government Bobby Jindal is now facing lawsuits challenging his educational plan to use vouchers to fund parochial schools, which include small Bible-based church schools. Look, there can be reasonable people on both sides of the debate on whether government should offer complete school choice to parents, regardless of the school's religious affiliation, or whether public funds should be restricted from going to any religious institution. What you can't reasonably do is advocate government funding for schools that follow your religion, but deny funding to schools of other religions. But the real fail of this doesn't even reach the subject of religion. This may be an unintended consequence of the legislation, but it was by no means unforeseeable. This podcast has covered numerous times where well-meaning legislation has had these side effects, sometimes even undermining the very reason for the legislation to begin with. But something that's this obvious that one could clearly see would be a veritable certainty just by thinking about it for two minutes? Did they not give any thought to what they were doing? And if this level of non-thought was put into this legislation, what other bills passed without even a tiny amount of thought to the consequences? It's not just limited to Louisiana. We've seen all sorts of states, and even the federal government, pass legislation without even so much as reading it, often basing their opinions on nothing more than the title of the bill. It has to stop. But it will only stop when voters start holding them accountable. Something else for Americans to consider as November approaches. And now it's time to shake down this week's biggest bogan emitter. We've covered the DMCA and how bad it's been. We've covered bogus DMCA takedowns. We've even covered NASA videos, public domain since they're produced by the federal government, being taken down. What could be more bogus than that? Enter your favorite fascists and mine, the Department of Homeland Security, getting videos taken down through copyright claims, even though it's impossible for them to hold a copyright on anything they do. Under Section 105 of Title 17 of the U.S. Code, works prepared by an officer or employee of the federal government in the course of his official duties are public domain. While it is true that this doesn't extend to private contractors hired by the government to create works, the copyright claim against any such infringement would be made by that contractor, not by the government agency. It would be bad enough if any federal department did this, but Homeland Security is much more sinister, especially when you consider that they also oversee domain takedowns that this podcast has covered in the past. Given that they can legally have no copyright claim to anything, doing this smacks of censorship. The only purpose and effect of such a takedown would be to silence free speech. This is blatantly transparent, and there can be no defense. And under the DMCA, the video must be taken down for a minimum of 10 business days. The fact that it is so blatant and indefensible can only mean that, in addition to being outright censors and violators of the First Amendment, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security absolutely must be this week's biggest bogan emitter. And now it's time to shout down this week's Idiot Extraordinaire! It's simple and universal. If you cheated, you didn't win. Whenever someone is caught cheating in a game or an event, their victory is stripped from them, and the runner-up is recognized as the true victor. Everywhere that is except for politics. Case in point, the recent Republican Party National Convention, where Mitt Romney was nominated over Ron Paul after much of what can understatedly be described as shenanigans. Really, if you get to make up the rules as you go along, and you still have to cheat, what kind of victory have you won? 
After a lot of pre-convention shenanigans, which included state delegations with significant numbers of Ron Paul supporters, such as Maine, barred from being credentialed at the convention, replaced with delegates of their own choosing. The cries of no and point of order were drowned out by chants of USA, USA. According to one North Dakota delegate, this was a coordinated effort set up ahead of time to try and drown out dissent. This continued as other delegates calling out point of order were likewise drowned out. Point of order means that some ruler procedure has been violated, and the violation needs to be addressed. The chair then has the obligation to hear what the alleged breach of rule is, and then to sustain it or overrule it. That process was completely cut off. Instead, Speaker John Boehner called for a voice vote, and despite there being little difference in the responses, declared that the eyes have it. But the chair cannot defer his ruling to the floor, and even if he could, it would effectively comprise a motion to suspend the rules, which requires a two-thirds majority. As a result, many delegates walked out in disgust. Another example is the Virginia delegation, who were prepared to vote against a proposed rules change to remove power from grassroots Republican activists and give it to the Republican National Committee. But the bus driver, hired by the RNC to transport the delegation to the convention, somehow got lost in an age of GPS and cell phones in a downtown area covering just a few square miles for over an hour, causing the delegates to miss the crucial vote. But they were just getting started. According to their own rules, if delegations want to nominate a candidate and have him speak, they need a plurality of just five states to request it. And actually, seven states did just that and prepared to officially nominate Paul. But one quick rules change later, and the requirement was changed to eight states. Repeated votes for Ron Paul from numerous states, including a supermajority from Nevada, were ignored, and only votes for Mitt Romney were counted. Here's the thing. A rules change at a convention is not supposed to take effect until the next convention. So even this rules change means that Ron Paul still should have been properly nominated and had his votes counted. As I said... If you can change the rules as you go along, and you still have to cheat, what have you really won? All of this means that Ron Paul supporters in the Republican Party have been disenfranchised, and grassroots activists have been marginalized in favor of greater centralized control of the party. Ron Paul supporters are now leaving the Republican Party en masse. There was a time when the Republican Party knew to at least give lip service to the idea of a big tent, allowing a diversity of opinion while fostering party unity. But at the 2012 convention, the Republicans undermined both of these. And with it, they lost the vote that could conceivably have carried Romney to victory in several crucial swing states. Delegates are now saying they'll write in Ron Paul, vote for Libertarian Gary Johnson, or not vote at all. Losses like the one that now seems likely for Romney are usually accompanied by complaints that votes for a third party took away votes from their candidate. A laughable contention, especially when the data are examined. But this year, the Republican Party has lost that excuse. If Romney really has lost votes, if so much of his support has gone to Johnson or elsewhere, then he and the Republicans have no one to blame but themselves. If it turns out that an Olympic gold medalist is cheated, they take away his gold medal. For example, gold medalist Tyler Hamilton had his 2004 gold medal for cycling stripped from him, with the gold, silver, and bronze medals reassigned to the three who finished behind him. Famous medalist Lance Armstrong is under investigation as well, and if found guilty, he too could be stripped of his titles. This is why Hamilton and other cheaters hide what they're doing. But the Republican Party did it openly and on national television. All of this confirms what this podcast said back in February. The Republican Party is a corrupt organization that, from the state level to the national, works to keep its power structure in place and safe from challengers. The goal of the Ron Paul revolution should not be to work within the Republican Party. It should be to expose this corrupt, possibly even criminal organization for what it is and make sure it goes down. And the Republican Party seems all too ready to help them do it. Which is why they're the only ones who could possibly be this week's Idiot Well, that wraps up this Take It Down, Smile and Frown, Talk of the Town, Sad Circus Clown, Surgical Gown, Yellow and Brown, Verbing the Noun, and All Through the Town edition of the Bogosity Podcast. Please visit the forums of Bogosity.tv, where you can read the show notes and join the discussion on these and other subjects. 
This podcast is free but not free to produce, so please use the donate button at the top of the Bogosity.tv website or down the right-hand side of the podcast page and give generously to keep this podcast going. And if you'd like to contribute to the podcast, just send a question, statement, news article, or rant to podcast at Bogosity.tv. Put it in an audio file, and if it's good enough, it'll get played right in the podcast. Thank you for listening. Until next time, here's a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. Every man takes care that his neighbor shall not cheat him. But a day comes when he begins to care that he does not cheat his neighbor. Then all goes well. He has changed his market care into a chariot of the sun. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derives 3.0 Unported License. Bogosity.